Okay, now we're going to talk a little bit more about leadership, moving on to Chapter 12, and we're going to look at some of the changing com concepts that have been happening in the past years around leadership models. First of all, we need to look at more of a prescriptive model of leadership. It's one thing to define leadership. It's another to actually ex execute and prescribe certain kinds of behavior. We're going to look at some of the research needed to develop a better explanation of what's called charismatic leadership. We're going to discuss transformational leadership and how it's a difficult concept to use in um, designing a leadership training program. We're going to look at internal and external causes of performance attribution. And we're going to identify situations and settings in which self-managed groups and, and self-leadership could be more useful and effective. We've been having much more difficult times in the past um, 10 years since uh, 2001. Um, and, you know, we've, organizations have responded differently to economic management at the federal and, and national and international level. Bigger companies are taking steps to, um, to be more proactive about the environment and, their, and, and their, their place in society. Businesses are trying to um, retain employees even in the face of financial losses. We're seeing, you know, the, the whole idea about survival. Um, leadership in general plays a big role in um, helping obtain uh, performance goals. Many organizations are being uh, um, uh, held a lot more accountable for outcomes and measured for them than ever before. Some leaders are better at performance enhancement than others. Good leaders provide coordination and control. They bring people together. They help design and map out a course. And they're usually very encouraging and provide recognition to the people that help them accomplish goals. In general, um, we have different options for our prescriptive approach to leadership. We see more and more um, use of self-managed work groups and teams in organization. We see more orientation towards people being more self-leaders in the works that they do. We're looking at a lot more situational approaches where we adapt um, task and work around um, the situation at hand. We have more um, emphasis on transformational leaders. We're doing a little bit more on the contingency approach of in terms of looking at rewards, or sometimes we actually have no leadership at all and assuming the maturity level of the workers is going to accomplish the goals. There isn't a universally acceptable model of leadership that we can teach you and say this is the way that needs to be done that will always work. One model that's been um, popular through the years is the Varum Yego leadership model. And they also say that there's no single leadership style that works in an organization, but they have um, a specific formula that they use in trying to decide which type of leadership they would use in those situations. Their focus is on the problem that needs to be solved in the situation that that problem occurs in. And the leadership used in one situation um, may constrain or, sh or not a situation used in others. Again, there's no one best style. There's um, social processes at work that influence whether subordinates are involved in the problem solving or approach to getting the work done. In the Vroom Jaeger, Jaeger model, Jaeger model the, um, it's used to evaluate the effects of participation. They look at the quality of the decision, how accepted that um, decision is among the subordinates, how, to how much time it takes to develop the subordinates, and also the time in achieving the goal. Um, it, when you look at this model, you're going to see a number of different um, mathematical formulas um, that aren't as complicated when you actually start looking at them. When you look at the decision efficiency, quality, and communication, and what kind of outcomes you get in terms of um, the, any kind of, and of, of the time it takes to accomplish that. You also look at the quality level of, um, you know, how effective it is, how much it costs, and the development involved in, in that model. We, in terms of the situational variables, we have information and expertise of the subordinates, and that has to be factored in when we actually go through the decision process. We might have time constraints. When you look at project management, we have on time within budget according to specification. So we have to, you know, when we get work done, we have to take account that we don't have all the time in the world. We might also have geographical restrictions or interactions, especially nowadays with how much the internet plays a role in people being distributed throughout the world to get the job done. We um, have different kinds of scales that we look at in, in terms of the room Yego, Yego model. Um, one of the main features of it is that there's actually yes-no judgments. Yes, this will work, no, and it's kind of a decision tree analysis. The, the big attributes that they deal with has to do with quality, the commitment level of the employees, how much time it takes, and the development process. The attributes um, on probability estimates of the accomplishing the goal has to do with 
how much information the leader has, how, problem, how problematic um, the goal is and the structure of it, um, the probability of commitment by the workers, how congruent these goals are with the um, needs and capabilities of the work teams and groups, how much conflict it might create, and how much information the subordinates need to accomplish the work. As you can see, there's a decision tree associated with um, the Verum Yego, Verum Yego model. And um, each one of these, whether you go C1, C2, L1, L2, and you'll, it talks a little bit more about the book, um, as you can see, the Y indicates if you made a yes decision, then you would follow this particular path. If you made a no decision, you'd follow this particular path. And again, it's based on time, commitment, development, and quality of the, of the performance of the workers. Um, there's many limitations and criticisms of this particular model. First of all, they say that this simplicity of the yes-no response really doesn't take into account how complex many work situations are. They're also saying that this model tends to be too complex for leaders and how quickly they need to respond to situations that it doesn't address. Um, really contemporary management challenges such as changes that occur technologically or the fact that there's international and global competition. Um, another theory um, that, is, that is involved in our um, uh, prescriptive approach to leadership has to do with attribution. And the, this includes the behavior of the followers, the, how the leader attributes their perceptions of these followers and their behavior. Um, the leader is actually a processor, for, processor of information when we talk about attribution theory. They usually look for clues as to why something is happening. So they'll be you know, taking in information and processing it. They construct different explanations that might you know, lead to a certain type of leadership decision in terms of how they're going to behave to the follower. Um, some of these um, causes of behavior might be the person, the context, um, who's involved in it. It might be um, in terms of when they form the behavior around attributions, how consistent they are, whether they talk to other people about their perceptions on something, if there's a consensus, and how distinctive and it might be within the context of the situation. Um, the leader who makes attributions of internal causes, um, the research has shown that they tend to uh, apply more punitive or punishment type of approaches to the, um, to the employees. When there's a problem and it's serious, they um, tend to respond a lot more harshly, harshly and they make a lot more decisions blaming internal structures. Uh, in terms of the, um, the attributional leadership model, you can take a look at this in terms of um, you know, what the informational cues are and what the per perception is. So you can see where the leader might look at um, different factors in the subordinates, what, the, what might be causing some of this in terms of there might be, they might be attributing that they're not applying themselves, that they don't have the capabilities. And then it might um, link to uh, whether they, what kind of um, actions they take, whether they fire them, demote them, transfer them, train them, reprimand them. Most of it tends to be punitive, as we said earlier. Um, in terms of the cause or effect, um, fo the follower behavior impacts the leader behavior and vice versa. So you know, um, once we get the dynamics going between leader follower behavior, it's really a question of you know who's leading who. If we have really good subordinates, the leader actually does um, a lot better. If we have a really good leader, then we might have the subordinates performing better. The research suggests that um, when we have leader consideration behavior um, towards the subordinates, that they tend to be a lot more satisfied. And the performance of the um, uh, leader's emphasis on consideration and the structure also leads to more high-performing organizations. Um, another theory that tends to be more positive it tends to be the charismatic leader. And they say that this evolves around the ability to influence others based on what they almost consider sort of a, um, a gift or attraction power, almost um, relates back to when we were talking about in the last chapter about trait theory, that someone tends to have a lot of charisma. Followers enjoy being with charismatic leaders because they actually feel inspired, they feel good, they feel important, they feel correct. Some examples of some of our charismatic leaders, um, as shown here in the slide, are people like our former president, um, John F. Kennedy, Mikhail uh, Gorbachev of the Soviet Union, Walt Disney, Sam Walton, um, and uh, there's many others that we could talk about. 
in terms of they've identified stages in charismatic leadership and when they say in stage one usually the leaders detected some sort of unexploited opportunity or deficiency in the situation and they're sensitive to the needs of their constituency and they begin to formulate some kind of strategic vision. In stage two, they um, communicate that vision. They articulate it in a way that ins is inspiring to their followers. In stage three, they start building trust um, based on the fact that they probably have expertise, that they're willing to take a risk, that they, um, they demonstrate more unconventional behavior or sacrifice towards accomplishing this vision. And in stage four, um, they demonstrate the means to achieve the vision by modeling uh, being a role model and, and empowering workers and using more unconventional leadership type of behaviors and tactics. Um, two types of charismatic leaders. We have leaders that tend to be visionaries that tend to look at the long term. They focus more on long term's need, long term uh, goals of the organization around and look at how they can inspire and motivate followers based on needs and goals. When we have crisis situations with um, with charismatic leaders, they tend to be able to respond very quickly to short-term situations. They tend to have, um, um, they tend to be able to, um, well, I guess we might use the term sort of wing it because they tend to be able to adapt pretty, pretty quickly when knowledge and resources are limited. And they're able to communicate actions needed to um, help the organization survive in a way that makes people feel strong and inspired. A transactional leader helps followers identify what needs to be done to, um, accomplish out, to accomplish results. They also take into consideration the followers' you know, concept of themselves and their self-esteem needs. And they rely on certain types of rewards or they make rewards contingent on, um, on performance outcome. And um, sometimes they actually do management by exception. So they don't say everything is, every, all employees are treated the same. They might take exception in certain things. Now we have a, um, a model here about transactional leadership of what the leader might do with a follower when they sort of assess what's going on with the leader, might figure out the role and some kind of behavior that they have. Ultimately, what they want to do is develop some sort of motivational capability to, for that employee to attain a desired outcome. And this is more specifically ta tailored almost on a one-on-one -on -one fact with, um, with the employees. In terms of transformational leaders, um, they tend to motivate followers to work for goals that are bigger than themselves, to be um, achievement and, and oriented and more um, finding uh, a sense of satisfaction and not just be oriented towards their, the security like their paycheck or just um, you know making sure they don't get punished. To achieve visions and tr um, transformational leaders often uh, begin making changes in just the overall mission of the organization, how they do business, they might move people around and resources in the organization. And some of the basic characteristics identified in your book, um, Bass has de defined five factors that he says describe transformational leaders. They tend to have what we recently described as charismatic. They tend to be um, uh, pay attention to the individual. They're very stimulated intellectually and cognitively. They link reward systems to behavior, performance outcomes, and they work with people on a one-on-one -on -one level, like management by exception. Um, we, you know, we talked about different prescriptions for leadership, but what if we don't have leadership in the organization? Well, um, some of the ways we can get, still have uh, effective outcomes is we might have really strong, cohesive work groups. And when you have a strong, co cohesive work group, you may not lead, need a leader. You also might have really structured tasks that are so clear and so focused that you don't need somebody overseeing them or providing some leadership in order to accomplish tasks. And we also might have um, followers that take so much initiative and know what needs to be done that they don't need much supervision or inspiration or motivation. In terms of um, some of the neutralizers around relationship-oriented leadership, uh, usually what, what happens with um, subordinates is there's, um, you know, there's a need for independence, professional orientation. They're indifferent towards organizational goals. So we have this relationship factor. In terms of the organization, they tend to be um, cohesive work groups. Uh, the reward doesn't necessarily fall within the leader's control to, um, to administer those rewards. And there might be more distance in terms of hierarchy between the leader or the superior and the, and the subordinate. And the um, tasks are intrinsically satisfying. They don't need a leader or manager to provide some kind of other external force. In terms of task-oriented, um, some of the subordinate characteristics 
tend to be that they have the ability, experience, and training. They, they, um, don't, they have a need for independence. They are, they're very professional. And again, they're indifferent towards organizational goals. Just give me the job, get the job done. They um, like jobs that are unambiguous and routine, that they uh, have the same methodology, and they can get their own feedback around whether they're doing the job or not. A lot of organizations design work so that people get feedback without waiting for a report from a leader or manager to say you did a good job or not. Task-oriented leadership um, neutralizers in terms of organizational characteristics determ is determined by the formalization, whether an organization is, uh, how inflexible they are, some of the uh, cohesive work groups that we talked about, um, again, the rewards aren't within the leader's control, and there might be some more distance between the leader and their subordinates.